I always talk about DAX in comparative value. SMSL and Topping do have lots of options and more every few months, and SHIT is still selling their cheaper gear in large quantities. We found on a regular basis that modern DACs don't vary much, if at all, in sound quality or sound signature. So the real question is not which DAC is the best, but rather which DAC has the features you want with the cheapest price. And then there are DACs like the SHIT Gungnir or the Yagdrazil, which cost $1300 to $2200. Let's not forget the recent R2R craze resulting in thousand dollar DACs with vaunted sound signatures but no modern amenities such as Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or an LCD screen. But if you think that spending one thousand dollars on a simple DAC is a bit much, you have yet to experience the full power of the dark side that is the audiophile marketing machine. I introduce the Matrix Audio X Sabre 3 Pro. Appos Audio sent me the Matrix X Sabre 3 for review. Appos and I have a continuing relationship where they loan me products from time to time. Appos is one of my primary go-to retailers for hi-fi gear. They've got all the popular stuff from the popular brands with competitive pricing. Appos has excellent customer service. Check out Appos Audio for your audiophile needs. Peasant, peon, or oligarch, they don't discriminate. The X-Sabre 3, or the Sabre as I'll call it from now on since it's a lot easier, costs, and wait for it, $3,000. Please wait while I dunk my brain in a bucket of ice. So yeah, 3000 bucks. Let's talk about that. Matrix Audio says that the Sabre comes with an ES9038 Pro DAC chipset. This is capable of the typical audio resolutions, including all forms of PCM and DSD. The Sabre supports MQA. The Sabre has dual Wi-Fi antennas, but they're hidden inside the chassis. The metal enclosure acts like an antenna itself. The Wi-Fi supports streaming Tidal, Spotify, Rune, and Apple AirPlay. You can select between sync and async clocks. This ostensibly allows you to bypass the DAC's internal clock and instead use the source device's clock or some other type. Matrix Audio does not plaster their marketing with measurement graphs. That's a refreshing change. Matrix says that the Sabre will provide 4.8 VRMS through the XLR and 2.4 VRMS through the single ended. Matrix makes no claims about the sound quality or sound signature of this DAC. As for build, you have to hold this DAC to fully appreciate its craftsmanship. It is easily the heaviest, sturdiest, most robust DAC I have ever touched. It is solid metal and weighs seven and a half pounds. The design is rectangular yet sleek. The back panel holds the XLR and RCA outputs, 2S LVDS input, coaxial, ethernet, optical, and USB. The front panel has a wide touch sensitive area with a circular OLED screen in the middle. There are nine hard-coded capacitive touch buttons. This includes power, input selection, volume adjustment, filter selection, the OLED dimmer, mute, sync mode, and access into the menu system. The OLED screen is pretty small by modern standards, but it is sharp, crisp, and bright. The screen will display sample rate, connection type, sync mode, the network status, and active filter. The outer edge of the screen shows the volume ring. The teal color increases with the volume. The touch buttons are, well, responsive. However, touch to command is a little bit slow. For example, if you press a button, there's a short lag before the screen displays the change. This is not a significant issue, but worth mentioning on a $3,000 device. You cannot, as far as I can tell, speed up this response time through the menu system. Overall, the Sabre is a gorgeous device. It is a tank, a beast. This is what Darth Vader would have displayed in his meditation chamber while he's force choking you. There is absolutely no doubt that as far as aesthetics are concerned, the Sabre has every single alternative product beat down, much like Darth Vader. But when it comes to features, well, that's an entirely different story. We have seen the Sabre's connection options on devices that cost one third the price and sometimes less. Furthermore, the high resolution audio support on the Sabre is nothing unique. We can find that sort of stuff on products in the $200 range. 
When you pay $80,000 for a Mercedes or BMW, are you getting a better car than a Honda Civic? Well, in a way, yes. If your definition of better is aesthetics, upgrade options, and notoriety, but if your definition of better is easy and affordable servicing, sturdy and reliable construction, and having modern conveniences built in without additional cost, then no, probably a Mercedes sedan is not better than a Civic. The reason I'm saying this is to put things into perspective. Obviously, there are tons of expensive audiophile gear. Headphones, amps, DACs, IEMs, DAPs, cables, earpads, you name it, and somebody somewhere has found a way to upcharge. Do we actually get more for paying more? If we do, are those additional things aesthetic or material? The Sabre, as I said, is $3,000. That's a lot of money for most people. Instead of assuming that a standalone DAC with this price tag must be superior, I'm going to put it through the same litany of tests I do with all my other gear. Here's the game plan. The test will be broken into two phases. In phase one, I'll talk about the overall user experience. I've had this DAC for nearly two months, and I've had the opportunity to use it with affordable, mid-tier, and uber expensive gear. The idea is to determine if the Sabre makes using a DAC any easier than any other alternative option, or whether the Sabre has features that I found were noteworthy, or faults or difficulties that should be highlighted. In phase two, I'll do the comparisons. I will compare the Sabre against a whole swatch of options. This includes the Songcause LA QXD1, Topping EX5, Burson Conductor 3X Reference, MyTech Brooklyn DAC Plus, iFi Pro IDSD, Matrix Mini i Pro 3, SMSL SU9N, and the KNI DAC 6. We will use the Gustard H16 as our testing amp. The Burson was used with its stock V6 op amps. The IDSD and iDAC 6 were used in their solid state configurations. All DACs were compared without applying any filters or EQ. The Gustard is a neutral transparent amplifier. It's got plenty of power for our testing headphones. Speaking of which, for all of these tests, I use the Sennheiser HD800S, the Head Audio Headphone Version 2, and the Odyssey LCD 4Z. I connected the Sabre and one of its competitor DACs to the same PC. I sent audio signal to both DACs at once using Voice Meter Banana. I connected each DAC to a passive AB XLR switch and then connected that switch to the Gustard amp. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Cobus. Yes, this is a rich man's setup. This is an oligarch's pleasure pad. I'm not remotely suggesting that you have to pair expensive components together, but I want to give this $3,000 DAC the best chance to demonstrate why it costs what it costs. I cannot speak for the internal construction. Nobody outside of Matrix Audio can confidently say that the components in this device are actually going to outlast comparative components in cheaper DACs. The only thing we are interested in is trying to hear for differences. Finally, we are going to delve into the menu system, streaming support, and other aspects of the Sabre, but we'll do that very briefly. I described my testing methodology a few moments ago. Here, we will go over my findings. Regarding Phase 1, where I summarize my overall experience with the Sabre over the last two months, I do have a few remarks. The Sabre is an easy plug-and-play device. We expect that from any modern DAC, so it's not a surprise with the Sabre. I did not need to download drivers, but did check the Matrix website for any new drivers or firmware that were necessary. The Sabre is a heavy DAC. It sits rock solid on my desk, and I'm quite thankful for that. Some other devices, such as the Pro IDSD, tend to shift around with the merest of touches. I also love the chassis, but not necessarily for the looks, even though I do. Instead, it is a breath of fresh air to find a DAC that does not need an external Bluetooth antenna. The chassis itself acts as one. This keeps clutter to a minimum and also reduces failure points. I've read a few reviews lauding the Sabre's internal power supply as if internal power supplies in amps and DACs are novel. They aren't. But I have to emphasize that it's nice that Matrix is sticking with the tried and true IEC cable. The RME ADI2, the Burson Conductor 3X Reference, and the Pro IDSD and ICANN all use external power bricks that terminate in fragile little power connectors. 
Not a good design for such expensive products, if you ask me. There were two issues I encountered, one minor and the other a larger annoyance. First, the startup time for the Sabre is fairly slow. It takes several seconds for the device to boot. Second, the bigger problem is the touch controls. If you leave the DAC in auto dimming mode, then when you want to activate the menu, you must touch one of the buttons. Touching the screen does nothing. If you touch anything other than the specific places where the buttons are placed, nothing happens. The issue is that the buttons dim, so unless you've remembered where they are, you will fumble around until you get to one. Overall, my two months with the Saber leave a positive impression as far as usability is concerned. This DAC never exhibited audible distortion or any other irregularities, I never had trouble connecting to my sources. The menu system never froze and I never had to reset the device. Now, let's talk about Phase 2 testing. Recall, this is where I compared the Sabre against several DACs throughout the price range. The Burson 3XR and Sabre had no discernible differences in sound. Flipping back and forth repeatedly, I never noticed greater clarity, detail, or any other alteration in sound in either of these products. I switched cables and the ports on my switch box, and the result was exactly the same. The iDAC 6 and Sabre appear to have a very minor alteration. Going back and forth, it seemed to me that the iDAC had slightly less clarity and vocals were ever so slightly more separated from other elements on the Sabre. This was really hard to perceive consistently. To double check, I switched to my Lenovo ThinkPad to reconduct this comparison. I made sure that both DACs were set to the same PCM filter, and in this case I chose the Fast Linear. The result was the same as before. The iDAC 6 appeared to have slightly less clarity, and the Sabre appeared to present vocals a bit more forward from the instruments. I have to emphasize this was a very, very minor difference. Switching to the Pro IDSD using the same tracks as before, there was no audible differences at all. Unlike with the iDAC 6, there wasn't even a hint of a difference. Switching cables and turning to my laptop for confirmation resulted in the same conclusion. The Pro IDSD in its solid state form sounds exactly the same as the Sabre. Turning to the Brooklyn DAC Plux, I had to first volume match through the Brooklyn. I achieved what I believed was correct volume match with the Brooklyn set to negative 7 decibels. Going back and forth on the passive switch, I heard no differences whatsoever. I retested on my laptop and got the same result. The Brooklyn and Sabre sounded identical. I next compared to the Mini i Pro 3 and the Sabre. These sibling products sounded, again, identical. There was not even a possible difference in sound. Back and forth, switching cables, alternating the ports on my switch box, using my laptop in a follow-up test, the results were identical. These two DACs sound exactly the same, with no alterations whatsoever in sound. Let's quickly look at the so-called lower-tiered options. In this case, I compared the Songkaz EX5 and the SU9N to the Sabre. The Songkaz and Sabre had no discernible differences. Bass, mids, treble, vocal placement, bass transients, treble clarity, yada 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 yada, it was all exactly the same. The SU9N had no obvious difference in sound or performance compared to the Sabre. Yet again, just as with the Songkaz, the presentation was identical. Whether I listened to rap, rock, classical, jazz, acoustic, or ambience music, never once was there a noticeable or even a minute difference. Repeating the test on my laptop and after switching cables resulted in the same conclusion. Finally, on the EX5, again, not an iota of difference. I switched cables, the inputs on my passive switch transferred from my desktop to my laptop, listened through my test playlist, and used the various headphones in my collection, and it always came back to the same thing. The EX5 and Sabre have identical presentation. Overall, except for the iDAC 6, the Sabre sounded exactly the same as every other DAC in this comparison, and even the iDAC 6 differences were minute. There was no epiphany while I listened to the Sabre, no moment of, aha, now the oyster opens. This DAC does not reveal intricacies of my music that were not already apparent to me through my other gear, and far cheaper gear at that. The Sabre never presented instruments or vocalists in a way to cause a religious experience for me. And since I'm not susceptible to religious dogma, maybe that's a precondition for me, I will admit. 
Regardless, I have no doubt whatsoever that in a blind test nobody would be able to tell the Sabre apart from the other devices I tested here, and even with the IDAC 6, I think the most discerning ear would indeed struggle. This is why we do true A-B tests. This is why you should assemble your own testing rig. I have a video on how to do that for DAX, and that setup doesn't cost you more than 25 bucks. Unfortunately, people do not implement true A-B tests, let alone blind tests. With a product as expensive as a Sabre, it's almost criminal to avoid a more rigorous approach. There is not much to say about the Sabre streaming, Bluetooth, and filters. I have already covered this stuff in the Mini iPro 3 review. You get basically the same on the Sabre. If you're interested, you should go watch the relevant portion of my Pro 3 review. The summary here is that the Sabre performs equally as well with Bluetooth and streaming as the Mini iPro 3. Except, of course, that selecting those sources is a little bit quicker on the Pro 3. As for the DAC filters, they make inaudible differences, as usual. This is not EQ. It's merely the same filters ESS and AKM throw in with every single DAC module. These filters ostensibly affect sound outside or at the very edge of our perception. There is no euphoric experience by using any DAC filter as there's nothing that ever immediately, obviously, consistently changes. Overall, the Sabre streaming and Bluetooth capability is perfectly agreeable. The fact that it can connect to Tidal and Cobuzz and Apple AirPlay is a bonus. They work just fine and as effectively as on cheaper products. Obviously, the Sabre received great praise from the reviewing community. That's par for the course. Bring out another shiny product tomorrow and the praise will repeat. When people don't bother to do true A-B tests and don't look deeper into a product's comparative features, then of course it will appear to be amazing. Here, my goal was to cut through the nonsense and just get to the point. That's why we compared this $3,000 standalone DAC against some of the creme de la creme of audiophile gear. The MyTech Brooklyn DAC Plus, the i5 Pro IDSD, the Burson Conductor 3XR, Matrix Mini i Pro 3, SMSL SU9N, and the KNI DAC 6. And, of course, we tested against far cheaper options. Some of these products use the same DAC chipset as the Sabre. Using strict A-B comparison parameters, I found that the Sabre has zero differences in sound signature except for with the iDAC 6. All of these DACs are transparent, neutral, and do not color the sound. One is not warmer than another. One does not have an audible difference in dynamics compared to another. We can also discuss audio quality. By quality, I mean audible distortion or clipping or anything else that stood out, anything that I could actually hear. And once again, none of these devices, from the cheapest to the most expensive, exhibited audible distortion or differences in sound quality. As far as I can tell, they all faithfully accepted the digital zeros and ones and processed them into analog signal. I'm sure somebody could argue that all of these devices have something unique to them. For example, the song causes a portable DAC with XLR output. The IDSD and IDAC 6 have tube output stages that can be activated. The Burson is a powerhouse product that rolls up in a clean, transparent DAC and into a mind-bogglingly powerful amp. The Mini i Pro 3 is an all-in-one solution to streaming and computer playback. The Sabre is also unique. It's got a chassis design that is out of this world. It is gorgeous, hefty, and ready-made weight-lifting device if you need to work out while listening to your DSD-512 tracks. The front panel is one of a kind. But, aside from aesthetic goodness, the Sabre has just two features, in my mind, that are not replicated in any other device in this litany of comparisons. First, the ability to bypass the clock with the push of a button, and second, the higher than typical voltage for both XLR and RCA. I have never found any need to worry about a DAX clock and sync. I'm sure there are reasons why someone else would, such as professionals who make multi-million dollars from their recording studios. But us mere audiophiles are probably kidding ourselves if we think we need to spend more money on an external clock. And on the Sabre, you can bypass the internal clock only through the LVDS connection, so you're actually pretty limited in your use scenario. When I look at the Sabre, I see a spectacularly designed product that holds performance that is replicated by far cheaper alternatives. 
I see and hear a product that is as capable to reproduce transparent sound as the $400 SMSL SU9N or approximately $200 song cost. You can argue about the quality behind SMSL or topping products. I'm sure there are meritorious complaints there. But if we're talking pure sound signature in an A-B test, if we're getting down to the nitty-gritty sound quality, there is no audible difference, other than the very minor one I heard on the iDAC 6. This brings me to something that caught my attention. After my review process was nearly complete, I checked for other comments about this product. I found one from Joshua Velour. Around 4 minutes and 40 seconds into his video, he says that this DAC is probably performing beyond the capability of his or our ability to hear. That's a succinct statement about most DACs. When it comes to THD, SNR, and jitter, if you can't hear it, then it is completely irrelevant. If a product has a transparent sound, then it has no effect whatsoever on the headphones and IEMs. If you're using CD quality flag for streaming, no pricey DAC is going to suddenly upconvert your original files to another god tier level. All of this brings me to value. No, absolutely not. Nowhere on this plane of realities that the X Saber 3 make a value proposition. This is an outrageous price for any standalone product, headphone, IEM, DAC, or amp, it doesn't matter. It's far too much money when there is no audible difference in sound quality or sound signature. My question for these types of products is this, why? Why make a product that costs this much money and why exclude a huge chunk of potential buyers? Why market something with a buy-in that is so high that it's laughed at on first sight? Because, in my opinion, the Matrix X Saber 3 is not for audiophiles. It's for art collectors. What's the one consistency you can find among the reviewers for this product? We all agree it's a good looking DAC. It's spectacular in that regard. It's a talking piece. It's a center of attention. It draws the eye. Stand this thing vertically and place it at eye level and nobody will walk past without taking a closer look. It's a shiny, unique looking product that grabs your attention, just like art. This is not a product for audiophiles. It can't be, because if it were a product aimed at audiophiles, it would actually be competitively priced or at the very least justify its price tag with tangible acoustic differences. But that's not what we get. Instead, this thing is in its own stratosphere. Here I am telling you how outrageous the price for the Sabre is, and yet I have the Brooklyn DAC Plus, the iDAC 6, the Pro IDSD, and the Burson Conductor 3XR. Yeah, but while all of these devices are very expensive, they all do something that the Sabre can't. Every single one of them has a feature that the Sabre cannot replicate. Except for the iDAC 6 and the song cause, all of these expensive competitors have powerful amps built in. And the iDAC 6 has a tube output state that you can choose to activate if you want. Oh, and the iDAC 6 is one-third the price of the Sabre. But you'd have to produce significant evidence to convince me that any of these expensive products are value. You could argue that since the Pro iDSD and iDAC 6 have unique features not easily replicated elsewhere, that therefore their prices are justified. At least that's an argument. But what about something like the Sabre? What precisely can you point to that is a tangible difference that has not been repeated in far cheaper devices? Aesthetics and clock sync. The former is subjective and the latter has limited application. What I'm getting at is this. If you're going to spend several thousand dollars on one piece of audio gear, there are alternatives that have more useful features, yet have identical sonic performance when compared to the Sabre and at lower price. It's so very odd to find people waxing poetic about DACs. DACs are the least important part of your audio chain. As long as a DAC has inaudible distortion and a stable connection, what more can a DAC actually offer? If a manufacturer is not specifically designing a DAC for an obvious sound signature, then what are people getting so excited about? Transparent DACs like the Pro IDSD, the Songcos, SU9N, Burson, and the Sabre are just that, transparent. Once you achieve that threshold, that's it. You don't get more transparent after being transparent. 
Imagine somebody saying that you get more wet by dunking in an ocean compared to dunking in a 10-foot pool. That's the type of silliness we're dealing with in regards to DAX. If people really want to hear different sound signatures, they should turn to headphones, IEMs, and even speakers, not to DAX. That's a huge waste of money for minimal, if any, alterations. Yes, plenty of reviewers, especially ones with a far larger subscription base than mine, say otherwise. Of course, I'm not surprised. When people, reviewers, and the general public refuse to do actual, true, strict A-B comparisons, you could easily believe that differences that don't exist, do exist. All of this brings me back to what I said earlier. You would choose to buy the Saber for its looks. How one of these products looks does tend to influence how we feel about it. That's not rocket science, but it is a factor we should acknowledge. You can subjectively convince yourself that something like the Sabre sounds so much better than anything else and it will be the result of visual or psychological bias. That is true for any gear. However, when we discuss equipment that costs as much or more than the Sabre, looks tend to play a far more significant role in the overall perception. When there's no objective reason to spend three grand on a standalone DAC, you do it for aesthetics or other completely subjective reasons just like buying art. If you've got $3,000 burning a hole in the bank vault you keep in your basement, then absolutely buy the Sabre. If I had some cash I needed to launder, I would definitely buy the Sabre. But unfortunately, my bank high schemes have not yet come to fruition, and so I'll have to wait. Look, I love Matrix Audio's design philosophy and gear. I have the original Mini-Eye and the Mini-Eye Pro 3. I love the aesthetics of the Sabre, but I don't know how to even begin to justify its outrageous price. So I won't. It's a ridiculous price for any standalone product. Save $3,000 for a lovely vacation, or put it away for a rainy day, or towards a new car, or just imagine the great headphones or REMs you could try with that amount of cash. But $3,000 for a DAC that will doubtless, without any hesitation in my mind, be replaced next year by the next hype product? Come on. Are you an art collector or an audiophile? <laughs>